I'm Dr. Charles Eaton. This presentation is for the 2017 Annual Scientific Meeting of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. I'm going to review the anatomy of Dupuytren cords. We'll start with the palmar fascia. And this is often thought of as the single structure involved with Dupuytren contracture, but that's an oversimplification. The palmar fascia is only one of many layers of a complex three-dimensional soft tissue scaffolding, which extends from the skin down to the hand skeleton. The palmar fascia gets the attention because in normal hands it's the most visible structure of the scaffolding, but in truth there are many other structures. There are sheets of tissue joined perpendicular to each other, and there are sheets of tissue which are quilted together by thousands of individual threads passing through a cushion of fat like the batting of a quilt. This scaffolding anchors the skin to the hand skeleton, and most important, it prevents the skin from sliding around during grip, which gives us a secure grip. During normal use, the scaffolding is subjected to a lot of mechanical stress and strain, and that's important because soft tissue strain is thought to be a trigger to activate Dupuytren disease. These are some of the many structures that are involved with Dupuytren disease and Dupuytren contracture, and it's a bit much to take in all at once. So let's break it down into bite-sized pieces, and starting superficially, uh, the layers in blue, the structures in blue, are superficial, and they, for the most part, have threads that go side to side transversely. We'll start with the distal first web space ligament, which continues on as the natatory ligament around the perimeter of the palm. The natatory ligament, which is fairly well defined, continues on distally as Grayson ligament complex, which is less well defined. The next layer down are the green fibers, and these are longitudinal fibers, and this is primarily what's called the palmar fascia. The proximal Palmar fascia is a sheet of tissue which in the mid-palm splits into the pretendinous bands and at the level of the metacarpal necks splits again into these spiral bands which course around the flexor tendon sheath and dive deep to the neurovascular bundle on each side of the finger and end about the point of origin of Cleland ligaments on each side. The next layer down has structures that are colored purple here the proximal first web space ligament, which continues on as the superficial transverse palmar ligament, and then out in the finger deep to the neurovascular bundle, Cleland ligament. Cross section of the finger at the proximal phalanx level, we can see the Cleland ligament, fairly stout sheet of tissue joining the lateral skin to the skeleton. Palmar to that, the neurovascular bundle, and palmar to that, a series of many individual fibers which cross from the lateral digital skin obliquely to the flexor tendon sheath and up to the dermis uh, on the other side of the finger. And collectively, these are called Grayson ligament, but they're, it's not the same type of discrete structure as you see with Cleland ligament. An oblique view, let's take a look at the colors for orientation superficially, the natatory ligament, which continues on as Grayson ligament. Next layer down, pretendinous band, which continues on, splits on each side, becomes the spiral band, ends about the web space. And the next layer down, we have the superficial transverse palmar ligament, and out in the finger, Cleland ligament. I took pictures from Roy Meal's Atlas of Forearm and Hand Cross-Sectional Anatomy and marked them up with these cartoon-like uh, areas to correspond to cross sections in the hand using the same colors that we've just been using. And starting in the proximal palm, we have the palmar fascia and the vertical anchoring fibers that hold it to the skin. A little bit further distal, we have the palmar fascia split into the pretendinous bands, and we have the origins of the first web space ligaments. A little further out, the superficial transverse palmar ligament is crossing, hugging the undersurface of the pretendinous bands. And then a little further out, we have this uh, interesting anatomic arrangement. It looks like a series of boxes, the floor of which is the transverse metacarpal ligament. The walls are the septa of Lagu and Javara, which are very much like the lumbrical fascia 
The roof is a superficial transverse polymer ligament. Everything looks so tidy here. And that doesn't last long. We get a little bit more distal and we lose the roof and uncover the prominences of these fat pads in front of the neurovascular bundle uh, in between each ray. And these normally are somewhat prominent, especially when the fingers are adducted together, and they're called the palmar monticuli. They're important in grip. Uh, most people are unaware of them, but when someone has early Dupuytren disease, and here the pretendinous band is split into the two spiral bands, and Dupuytren can cause these areas to retract slightly, which places the palmar monticuli in prominence. You can see in between, these bulges are just the normal tissue that exists between the rays. Patients think that these are fluid collections or nodules, but they're actually the normal area of hand. A little bit distal to that, we see the spiral cord has, the spiral band has uh, split on each side and descending down to pass deep to the neurovascular bundle on each side. And a little bit further out, we see the natatory ligament, which is um, going to continue on as Grayson ligament. The spiral band on each side is aimed toward its destination, which is the lateral digital skin. And we go a little bit further out and see that the natatory cord has become Grayson ligament. The spiral cord is stopped, and that function is continued by Cleland ligament. And this is at the web space. And beyond this, we're out in the finger, and we have this what looks like a more simplified arrangement, but is actually a complex uh, hemi-circumference of the front of the finger, which can lead to many different cord patterns. Cleland ligament, Grayson ligament, neurovascular bundles. And as we go on, that continues. When we get to the distal phalanx, we lose the uh, distinction of those different structures, which may be part of the reason why we don't get longitudinal cords in the distal phalanx, distal to the flexor tendon uh, termination. This is a heat map of nodule and cord locations of uh, 2,300 previously untreated hands of people with Dupuytren disease. And you can see the nodules tend to form in the midline in areas where there's a lot of contact with grip. But the cords that follow seem to go a bit more into lateral directions, which uh, more closely follow the anatomy of fascial structures underneath the skin. Cords can develop in any of these named structures and also in areas where there aren't clear anatomic um, names. So the pretendinous cord develops uh, in the area of the pretendinous fibers. If you go a little bit distal in the finger, the central cord forms where there isn't a pre-existing longitudinal fascial structure. Other structures, including the, the natatory ligament, the distal and proximal first web space ligaments, the fascia of the abductor pollicis brevis or the abductor digiti minimi can be involved in and out in the finger because it's three-dimensional. We can have a variety of, of cords, lateral, superficial, a spiral cord beginning deep, passing under the neurovascular bundle and ending up superficial and displacing the bundle, and deep to that, a retrovascular cord. And just another view of these, an oblique direction, pretendinous, central, lateral digital, retrovascular, and spiral. So just to simplify things, four main cord types out in the finger. 
Central cord's most common. It, it's the nicest also because it bowstrings so you can feel it and it's not close to the neurovascular bundle nor does it displace it. Also uh, fairly common, the retrovascular cord which doesn't bowstring lies deep to the neurovascular bundle and uh, is something that may account for uh, residual contracting force uh, despite the absence of a palpable cord. Less common, lateral cords, which don't bowstring the neurovascular bundle but are near it at the base of the middle phalanx. And then spiral cords, which are the um, riskiest, bowstring the neurovascular bundle up into harm's way. They can be central or lateral, uh, and they can show up out in the finger or proximally in the palm. This is a heat map of Doppler locations of uh, 70 patients with Ubertrin disease that had no prior treatment. You can see that there's a tendency for the cords to be more uh, central in the palm, where they're more common, and more lateral out in the digits, where they're less common. Metacarpophalangeal joints uh, are primarily affected by central cords. You can have other cords as well. Um, but the situation is very different in the proximal interphalangeal joint where there's no dominant cord type. Central cord is the most common, but it's not a majority. Retrovascular cords are fairly common, spiral or lateral cords less common, and contractures of the accessory collateral ligament are also significant contracting forces in PIP joints. PIP joints, unlike the metacarpophalangeal joint, uh, PIP joints commonly will have more than one uh, structure which contributes to contracture. And the greater the degree of contracture, the more likely there are multiple structures involved, uh, cords, accessory collateral ligament. And retrovascular cords are more common for PIP joints with a greater than 45 degree contracture. Beyond the cords, there are uh, problems with the PIP joint, which are complex, and there are two sets of issues with this. The first is the uh, polymer plate uh, is known to develop uh, shortening with prolonged PIP flexion. The accessory collateral ligament with prolonged flexion shrinks in a longitudinal and AP direction. And particularly after fasciectomy, the flexor tendon sheath uh, can be a persistent uh, force that prevents full extension. These three uh, issues contribute to incomplete correction, that is, inability to get the finger all the way straight uh, during surgery or during an extension procedure. But beyond that, the extensor mechanism can have changes which don't prevent uh, initial correction but may contribute to early loss of correction. So the uh, central Extensor stretches out and doesn't uh, maintain the ability to fully extend the finger with all joints in extension, so uh, that will prevent the finger from being actively extended during the recovery time. Also, the lateral band can shrink or sublux palmarly, and that in it also can uh, not necessarily block passive extension but may limit active extension and contribute to loss of initial correction over the first few months of recovery. And that's it. It's a short talk. Uh, one of the take-homes is if you really want to know this anatomy and you don't operate on this every single day, it's very, very helpful to draw it, like the brachial plexus. And it's a humbling experience, and I recommend that highly to you. Thanks very much.